did it on purpose, didn't you? I'm going to get you, boy. <laughs> He's up there just screening ear to ear. I know he did that on purpose. All right, well, it's so good to be back at Winton Place. I appreciate the goodness of the Lord, the opportunity to be here. I uh, had touched base with Brother Daniel, I guess, a couple, three months ago. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't really invite myself, but I said, have you got anybody coming the fifth Sunday? He said, I don't know, do I? <laughs> I said, you do now, so here I am. Uh, but anyhow, it's good to be it's good to be with you. The last time I was with you, I was still the pastor of Bethesda Baptist Church there in East Flat Rock, and uh, my, how much has changed since then. Um, so I don't need to go through the whole introduction thing. You guys know me, and uh, I'm glad that that's the case. It's good. I feel at home, amen, among God's people here. So uh, anyhow, most of you know that while I pastored, I was bivocational. Um, I've done a little bit of everything. I'm technically a carpenter by trade, but I've done just about anything I could over the years just to keep the ends touching. If I'd have made it until May, uh, it would have been 12 years in the pastorate there, uh, 12 years of persecuting the saints. But, they <laughs> but uh, the, Lord, uh, the Lord saw fit to move us. But uh, from 2012, uh, really the end of the, of the year there in 2012, I started just kind of going and helping Brother Bob Doom at the, the Russian Bible Society, Revival Literature, and Global Baptist Mission, and uh, just kind of was trying to help him along. He had lost his, uh, his other assistant, and uh, I just kind of went to fill in the gap for a few weeks. Uh, but while I was there helping him, uh, the Lord put it in my heart to just stick with him. And so I ended up uh, taking a position there as assistant to the director from that point, about, uh, about the beginning of 2013 until the middle of 2017. And so I got to labor beside Brother Doom and just kind of see what he did and uh, how the ministries operated there and uh, really got a heart for the work that they're doing, that we were doing there. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what we do in a minute. But anyhow, uh, about the middle of 2017, the Lord started dealing my heart about just uh, the, the, the fact that the ministries needed more out of me than I could give them and pastor to. And uh, I had a pastor's heart. I knew I was supposed to focus on the church. So I told Brother Bob, I said, Brother, I'm going to have to step away so you can find somebody that can give you the attention you need here and uh, so that I can go and focus on the ministry of the church. And so I did that. In 2018, Brother Bob called, and they had asked me to sit on the board of directors for the Russian Bible Society. And so I've done that since that time. Um, th from then, I did a little bit of uh, a little bit of everything uh, just to keep in the ends touching, but nothing that was too time consuming and just focused on the church and the pastorate. I really felt like I'd die there. I, I had it in my mind that I was going to be an old white haired guy and finish the last verse of the book of the Revelation and go home and just pass away and go be with the Lord. That's kind of what I had in mind. I was content to do that. I'd already settled in my heart that. The Lord wanted me there uh, with 35 folk till, till the end of this thing, that that was good and uh, had that in mind. Well, I won't go into all the details, but about uh, the end of 2019, God started doing some things in my heart that I really did not understand at that time. And I think he was just preparing me for stepping away from the pastorate altogether. And uh, uh, long story short, uh, back in November, Brother Bob went to be with the Lord. He had... Uh, he was wide open, his whole ministry, and, there, and there didn't let any grass grow under his feet. How many got to meet Brother Doom? I know, I know Miss Hope and y'all had, but, but Jason, he, uh, I mean, just a man of God that ran for the glory of God. He burned the candle at both ends, and he was 83. He had been up in Maryland preaching a revival meeting. I think he'd preached four nights, and he came back and uh, realized that he had caught COVID, and uh, that's, when, uh, that's when he got sick, and so he, he ended up passing away at the end of November of last year. And uh, as soon as he did that, the Lord just started reminding me of the ministries here and the burdens he did put in my heart while I worked there and of the importance of the work that was going on. And uh, so I started praying about it. We had a joint meeting with the boards of directors for both ministries. And uh, it was even clear in that meeting that I wasn't the only one with me in mind. And uh, so I ended up uh, announcing my resignation at the church back in February. They allowed me to spend some evening services away until my final Sunday, the first Sunday of April, just raising a little bit of support in the meantime so that when we left the pastorate, we wouldn't be with all, all together without any uh, monies coming in. And so April the 3rd was my last Sunday as pastor at Bethesda Baptist Church. 
And uh, since then, been on deputation. I'm still working some. I think the month of June, I worked six days. Uh, the Lord's kept us busy. It's been a blessing just to be able to go around. He's opened a lot of doors to... Uh, to present the, mur the burden of the ministries, to present ourselves as missionaries, and uh, to raise some support. Uh, we were accepted, my wife and I, as missionaries with Global Baptist Mission. I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a moment. That's part of the work that we're doing. And uh, then uh, around the same time that I left the pastorate, the Lord worked in my wife's heart about coming on board with the ministries as well. The lady that's been our bookkeeper and secretary for the last 16 years uh, had said that she was going to retire at the age of 70, and that was June the 30th, and she was sticking to her gun. She said, no, I'm done. I need a break. I need time. And so she had, uh, she had said that she was leaving, and I was nervous about it because Brother Bob had already left, and now Sister Nita was going to be leaving the ministry, and those two brains operated this ministry. Miss Nita was the backbone of the thing. And so I was concerned, but I mentioned it to my wife. She started praying. We were just praying about it, and the next time I mentioned it to her, she said, well, about that. The Lord had been dealing with her heart, and so she left the bank. She'd worked at the bank almost 20 years, and God put it in her heart to leave there. So she went in April and began to train with Miss Nita and uh, to learn the ropes of the ministry. And so June the 30th, Sister Nita stepped away, and uh, now Sister Judy is handling the day-to-day -day bookkeeping and all the stuff. She got to close out the books for the first time on her own uh, Friday and uh, went smoothly. So we praise the Lord for that. And so now we get to ride to work together every day. Amen. And it's not just work. It's service to the Lord in ministry. And, man, it's been great. We've even got along. She hadn't, uh, she hadn't fussed at me or thrown nothing at me yet. It's been a blessing. And uh, the days I have to work, it's kind of a bummer. I'm still having to leave and go do something else and knowing she's there at the office. And uh, so it's just been a blessing. But anyhow, um, we have, uh, I, th I think I've been in over 30 churches now since, uh, since February. Man, the Lord just helped us. And uh, just been wide open, been on the road, and uh, just telling people about the work. So I want to do that. The first, the first area of the ministry that I'll mention is called the Russian Bible Society. And uh, there are some, uh, let me mention these. There's two books on the right-hand side of this little table up here, uh, Exiled in Russia and Evangelism in Print. Both those books tell a little bit about the founders and the ministries themselves, how they began. I brought enough, I hope, for every household to take one. And so I want you to take one each of those. Those are, those are no charge. There's also a price list for the other books we publish, but I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. But the Russian Bible Society was started in the 1800s, and soon thereafter it was shut down by one of the czars, uh, Czar Nicholas, I think was his name. And uh, it was shut down for many years, but in 1944... Uh, Brother uh, Basil Mayloff, also known as William Fettler, re, uh, restarted the Russian Bible Society. And he did that uh, to smuggle scriptures into the Soviet Union. He had a heart to see uh, the people behind the, behind the Iron Curtain have the scriptures in their hands. And so he was dedicated, dedicated himself to getting the scriptures to them. He planted several churches in the Soviet Union, one in Riga, Latvia, and I believe it was two in Moscow. The one in Riga is still going, and uh, I'm pretty sure the one, in, one of the ones in Moscow is still going even today, uh, still preaching the gospel over there. But they got wind of what he was doing, and they exiled him to Siberia. And in that day, that was really just a death sentence. Uh, but uh, the Lord had used him early in his ministry to see some, uh, some of the higher echelon aristocrats get saved, and they came to his aid. They said, look, if you want to send him away, send him away, but please don't send him to Siberia. And so he ended up in London, and he trained in Spurgeon's College there in London. He spent some time in other places in the world, and even here in the States, ended up with, uh, I believe, with um, citizenship in the United States. Uh, but was just dedicated to getting the scriptures into the hands of the people behind the Iron Curtain. And uh, that, that, that ministry morphed into, uh, especially after the curtain fell, into seeing the scriptures translated into the languages of all those countries that had been under the Soviet Union. Uh, of course, they had been forced to speak Russian. They still had their native tongues, but they were not allowed to use those in day-to-day -day, day -day practice and business and things like that. And so uh, there was a great need for the scriptures to be translated. The Russian Bible Society has seen several of those languages uh, get scriptures in them. Lithuanian, I believe, is on our list. There's some lists of, uh, lists of projects that have been completed on the back of one of our brochures, several things that have been done. 
Uh, one of the most notable and the one that we're uh, most thrilled about right now is the Ukrainian scriptures. And there's a copy of the Ukrainian New Testament on the left-hand back corner of this table up here. And uh, uh, during the time that I worked with Brother Bob, he got wind of a fellow by the name of Yura Popchenko. Brother Yura lives in the Ukraine, lived in Kiev, Ukraine. You've probably heard that city mentioned recently uh, with all that's been transpiring over there. Uh, but Brother Yura saw the need for a Ukrainian Bible. Now, in Ukraine, they had one available, but it was not widely accepted. The dialect was rough. The translation work was as good as the man that did it could do, but it was still lacking. And so the Ukrainian people for years now have lived their lives in Ukrainian, but when they've come to church, they've read out of the Russian scriptures and preached out of the Russian Bible. And Brother Yura was dissatisfied with that. He wanted to see the scriptures in their own language, especially considering the fact that in the school system and things like that, now they were using Ukrainian, teaching Ukrainian as first language. And so he began to do that work when he first got out of high school. He went to Moscow. He trained in Hebrew and Greek and uh, is fluent in uh, multiple languages and a, an excellent linguist. And uh, so he began the work of translating the scriptures into the Ukrainian language. Well, uh, obviously, one man by himself working to support a family, the work was going slow. And uh, back in the, during the time that I was with Brother Bob, Brother Bob heard about Brother Yura. And he flew him to the state, sat him down, talked to him about his philosophy of translation, uh, found out that he did believe that scriptures ought to be translated from the Hebrew Masoretic text and the received text of scripture, and found out that he believed in formal equivalence. That's word by word, word for word translation. And Brother Bob got a heart and a burden for him, and so he began to, not only through the Russian Bible Society, begin to monthly support Brother Yura, but also to help him get support in other places. And through all of that, uh, he was able then to hire a team of people to help him to translate. And it sped the work up to the point that about two years ago, the New Testament was finally completed. And that's what's on the table back here. And uh, I, I just believe God knows what's going to happen before it ever happens. And uh, so you think about the timing of that. Just a couple years ago, here we are with Ukraine now being invaded by Russia. And if there's ever been a time when Ukraine wants to be rid of the Russian language, it's now. And now they have a translation of Scripture in their tongue that is being widely accepted and used. And so anyhow, that began to be distributed. And Brother Ura is now working on the Old Testament. He has fled Kiev. He's living in Germany right now. And he uh, was over there trying to figure out what he was going to do next because he had fled after the bombing started. And uh, a little Baptist church in Germany uh, gave him an office in their church. And so he's just kind of settled down there and he's been able to continue the work of the translation uh, there in an office in a Baptist church in Germany. And he's hoping to get the Psalms done. And we really need him to do that because he's holding off reprint until that's accomplished so that he can print the Psalms and the New Testament together. Now that's important because as it stands right now, in our warehouse, we've got four of those left. And the reason we've only got four of those left is because we've been shipping them all around the world and they're being taken over to places like Poland and Romania and all those bordering areas and they're being distributed among the refugees coming out of Ukraine. Um, one particular instance that's really blessed us lately is uh, one of the members of the board of directors for the Russian Bible Society uh, was preaching regularly a meeting in the middle of the state of North Carolina out in the Greensboro area and he was associated with a church who had a ministry associated with them that ships humanitarian aid around the world in containers. And they put gospel literature and tracts and Bibles in that aid and in that, uh, in that uh, material. And they had 10 containers worth that they wanted to send to Ukraine, but they would not send it because they did not have any gospel material. Well, the member of our board of directors found out what was going on. He said, I happen to know a place where you can get some material. And so we made contact with him. Our director, Brother Ben Wilkerson, he got on the phone, and we orchestrated the thing and got 10 pallets ready. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the members of that church in Greensboro knew a Ukrainian-speaking pastor in Greensboro whose brother-in-law owned a trucking company. And so he sent a truck to Asheville, North Carolina, picked up those 10 pallets of material that we had. They took those back, stuffed that stuff into that humanitarian aid, and shipped it to Poland. Now it gets even better. Just inside the Ukrainian border from Poland, 
there is a pastor of a congregation there who a couple years ago got it in his mind that he wanted to run for mayor of the little town where he pastored. When he started telling them that he wanted to do that, they said, Pastor, you're nuts. One man cannot be a politician and a preacher. It's an oxymoron. Politicians are crooked and pa pastors are supposed to be righteous and you can't do it. He said, I don't know what to tell you, but God said run for mayor. And so he ran for mayor and he won. Well, during all of the invasion and the war and everything else, Ukrainian officials changed the laws of the country of Ukraine to where anything now coming into the country has to be received by an elected official. And it just so happened this Ukrainian pastor just inside the Ukrainian border out of Poland was the mayor of this town. And so all this material is going to Poland, and that fellow's got a truck coming into Poland, getting that material, and they're taking it into Ukraine and distributing it among Ukrainian people. Uh, gets even better than that. There was a young man associated with the ministry in Greensboro, North Carolina, who was a Ukrainian native that had been adopted. And he went to Ukraine just before the war broke out just to go see things and just kind of investigate his homeland, I guess. And he got over there and bombs started falling and they tried to pull him out. They said, you've got to come home. He said, I'm not doing it. He said, I want to be here. I want to help all that I can, my people. And this is a young man that's saved. And so uh, we found out uh, just shortly after all of this had transpired that he has got drones with cameras on them and he's flying those around Ukraine, finding safe passage for all this material as they distribute it among the Ukrainian people in Ukraine and then to those coming out uh, there in Poland. Well, in all of our uh, excitement to get a shipment together to get stuff to send them, we said, well, Ukrainian people can speak Russian, and we only got a limited number of Ukrainian Bibles, so let's send some Russian stuff too. And so we sent uh, several Russian Bibles. We sent, uh, I think it was 75,000 some odd gospel tracts, God's simple plan of salvation in Russian, and we sent those along with that shipment. They got to the, play, the people that were going to distribute it, and they said, you know what? We're a little hesitant to give that out to the Ukrainian people just because of the attitude they have right now toward Russians, and you can imagine how that is. They said, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to work out a way to get that Russian material to Russian soldiers that are on the ground in Ukraine. And so they're working that out, trying to figure out the best way to get that material to the Russian people that have come into Ukraine. Most of the Russians that are uh, fighting there really aren't, uh, they're really not attached to the cause. They're not a fan of it. And they're doing what they're supposed to do as soldiers. But it seems like they're sympathetic toward Ukraine. So now they're distributing those among among them. So what, Russia, what the Russian Bible Society does is really twofold. We oversee the translation of scriptures and other Christian materials into the languages of countries that were formerly Soviet Union, and then we oversee the distribution of those things and uh, try to get them out to as many people as possible. And the Ukrainian New Testament's a good example of start to finish what we do. Now, obviously, I don't do any translation work. I can't even speak good English, uh, but we do have uh, just great contacts. We've got a man now that's also working on a, uh, another New Testament for the Republic of Georgia, and he's got a lady that's working alongside him, and so that translation's ongoing. I really believe that Brother Yura is going to be key to uh, many more of, the, uh, of those languages, getting the scriptures in them. He's qualified. He knows the languages. He's got a son now who's also gifted in that area, and he's been learning Hebrew and uh, Greek himself, and so he's training, and he's helping Brother Yura in the translation there. He's got a lady by the name of Anya on the team, and she's done a good work. And so I'm looking forward to the completion of the Ukrainian New Testament. I believe the Lord's going to use him uh, for some other works as well. So that's the work of the Russian Bible Society. We also distribute uh, thousands of Russian synodal uh, parallel uh, English translations around the country here in America. And so we've got those. We publish that. The global or the Russian Bible Society publishes that parallel Bible. And uh, there's one of those on the desk as well. Then there's the work of the Global Baptist Mission. And within that, there's a Global Bible Society, which does basically the same thing as the Russian Bible Society, but with non-Slavic languages. You'll find on the table here, we have some Cherokee material, some Choctaw material, and some Creek material, some Native American uh, language material here. Um, and we've got a bunch of that that is public domain stored in our facility. Uh, Brother Scott Silver, some of you may know him or have heard of him. 
He's working out there uh, in Smithfield, Oklahoma. He has just recently gotten the opportunity to go and work among the Cheyenne and the Arapaho. And he called me and said, what have you got available in those two languages? And so I got to looking at our little, uh, our little bookshelf back there. I said, well, we've got Luke and Arapaho, and we've got the entire New Testament in Cheyenne. He said, send them to me. And so he was going to write a gospel tract incorporating scriptures from the gospel of Luke, have that translated into Cheyenne and Arapaho, and make it up uh, in a kind of an evangelistic tract form. And when he goes out there to have tent meetings and things, hand that out to people in their native tongues so that maybe they'll come to the meeting and in the process get the gospel. And so part of that's what we do. We also have a bunch of Arabic material. Uh, we're figuring out ways right now to get that in distribution. Brother Bob had, I think, purchased about $32,000 worth. And it's sitting there in the warehouse, and we've been trying to figure out ways to get it out of there. We don't want them sitting in the warehouse collecting dust when they can be in the hands of people. People need the Word of God, and so we're doing all we can to try to figure out how to get that out. Uh, we've talked to the people that published that. There's a, there's a chance that we might be able to see that actually distributed in some of the Muslim-run countries where, uh, where they can um, get the Word of God into the hands of Arabic speakers. But I got an evangelist that I met. And I uh, hadn't met him long. I hadn't known him long. I met him. We made friends on Facebook right about the time I left uh, the church and came to the ministries here. And just a few days after the friend request deal, he starts posting up on Facebook looking for Arabic Bibles. I said, I know a guy. Amen. And so I got in touch with him. I sent him a box of what we had, and he's been distributing that on airplanes and in hotels where he travels. He says there's a lot of Arabic speakers there. He said, they won't really talk to you, especially the ladies. He said, but if you lay something down on the seat in their language, when they come through cleaning that up, he said, they'll pick it up and read it. And so just stuff like that, trying to get the scriptures into the hands of people. I've been praying that God will let us pioneer uh, some works. I was, I was looking at some statistics, and in 2015, the American Bible Society uh, did a study, and they said that 57% of the active first languages on the face of the earth still don't have scripture in them. I thought that was amazing. I mean, it's staggering. We think about our language. We've got multiple translations, multiple Bibles sitting around in our house, and there's so many places that have no scripture in them. And so I've been praying the Lord would just lead us to the right uh, place. I met a guy a few months ago I've got to get in touch with. He mentioned a language uh, of some people that they'd visited in some ministry trips that didn't have any scriptures in it. And so uh, just trying to get settled in where I can figure out how to go about that. Who knows, that may be the next thing the Lord would have our ministry to do. And then I mentioned the mission board, and I know when you say mission board, a lot of people draw up. Uh, but I want to say this first off, we do not send missionaries. Uh, the local church sends missionaries. That's a local church job. I'm a local church man. I believe in the local church. That's how God does whatever he does. Uh, all we do, really, as far as the mission board goes, is, is try to uh, locate and find good, solid, Bible-believing, gospel-preaching missionaries who need a little help as far as their, their finances go, and we just handle that. It comes into us, and 100% of what comes into us for them goes right back out to them. We don't charge them for that. A lot of mission boards do that. And so we're just there to try to aid and help them as they garner support and raise support like I said, my wife and I are part of that, but we're also a member of a local church. We actually joined uh, Grace Fellowship Baptist Church last Sunday morning. It's the first Sunday we were home, and I don't know when, so we had to take advantage of it while we were all together. And so, uh, but, but don't think that we're against the local church. We're not. We want to help and aid you know, those missionaries, but the local church sends missionaries. And so uh, we're just trying to help them in that regard. And then the, uh, the, the Ministry of Revival Literature. And you'll remember last time, some of you probably remember, I had the book table set up. I didn't bring it today, mainly because I'm leaving here and I've got a service at 2, and then I'm leaving there and I've got another one at 6, and I just don't think I'm physically able to set that thing up and tear it down three times in one day. Brother Bob probably did, but I just ain't got it in me yet. Uh, he could have probably done it in his sleep. But, uh, but anyhow, I uh, typically would have had the book table. Well, what I do have, the yellow list here, is a list of the books that we carry. And uh, I would just mention kind of the beginning of that. If you read Evangelism in Print, the little book in the front right there, you'll find a little bit about the founding of revival literature. Um, Brother James A. Stewart is a missionary evangelist that founded that ministry. And uh, he, he was used of God. He got saved at a young age, was preaching by the age of 14. He was in Glasgow, Scotland. 
and he spent his childhood with scripture signs running around the streets of Glasgow preaching the gospel to anybody that would listen. And he just had a heart to serve God and to give the gospel. And so he spent his life doing that. He did it all over the world uh, in multiple countries and places. And God used him mildly to see real revival in a lot of places. Uh, but during all of his preaching campaigns, he got sick and he was in Morocco and he got to the place where they told him, they said, look, you're going to have to cancel some meetings and you're going to have to take some rest. You're going to kill yourself running like this. And so they put him in a little mission house in Tangier, Morocco, and he was told to be on bed rest. But what they didn't know is at that same time, there was a missions conference planned in Tangier, Morocco, where missionaries from all around the world were coming, and they were going to gather for this missions conference. But the main speaker that was scheduled for that got uh, held up in another country and could not get there. So they're all wondering, what are we going to do, praying about who would speak at their missions conference. And they found out that Brother James Stewart was in the area. So they went to the little mission house, knocked on the door. They said, look, there's no accidents with God. You're here on purpose. We need somebody to preach to us about missions, and you're the man for the job. He said, I can't do it. I'm on bed rest. They said, look, you don't even have to preach. They said, we'll set a little chair up. You can sit in a chair and talk to us about missions. And so he agreed, and for the next several nights, he sat in that little chair and preached to them about the ministry of the Spirit of God and the need of him in missions and Christian service. And while he's doing that, his wife, Miss Ruth, gets a bright idea. She says, this is good stuff. I need to put this in book form. So she got a typewriter, began to type and transcribe everything he was saying. And uh, at the end of that, they put that into a book that we still publish. It's called Heaven's Strong Gift, one of the best books you'll ever read on the ministry of the Spirit of God. Heaven's Strong Gift. And it is, uh, man, I've read it. This I'm going through it now again, and uh, just a blessing. I, I'll give you a quote from the book that I thought was amazing. James Stewart said this in his book. He says, As the world rejects Jesus Christ and his ministry, so the church rejects and neglects the Spirit of God and his ministry. I thought, man, that is profound. But that's exactly where we are. And uh, the need for the Holy Ghost, the reason we don't see what we may have seen in days go by and what we need to see in these days is because we have neglected, we have grieved the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost that would empower us, enable us. And uh, you'll remember, I guess, my first time here, I preached on being filled with the Holy Ghost. I think that's so critical. And the reason, the, the, one of the things that God has used in my life to emphasize that need is the writings of Brother James A. Stewart and others like him. And so I would recommend his books highly to you. He wrote a book called The Invasion of Wales, a tremendous little book that just recounts the Welsh revival of 1904-1905. Brother Evan Roberts used mildly of God there. That revival broke out, and it was so real that at the end of it, the farmers had to retrain their mules. And the reason they had to do that is because they'd been so wicked and so vile that in training those mules, they had used vulgarity and bad language. But when God saved them, he broke their cusser. Can I get an amen right there? Anybody get saved and had to quit cussing? Amen. But God broke their cusser. And so they got out there in the fields and tried to get their mules to cooperate, to plow, and they wouldn't budge because they didn't understand what they were saying. So they had to retrain their mules. Wouldn't it be great if God would do something like that in Cincinnati, Ohio in 2022? Man, that'd be wonderful. I wish he'd come and just breathe like that on Asheville, North Carolina, and Hendersonville, North Carolina, and do a work for us like that. Brother, things are dark and bad out there, and sin abounds, but grace does much more abound. I believe the Spirit of God could just settle down for just five minutes, do more than we could do in decades of trying to see the Lord work. And so that's really what the thrust of revival literature is. That's why we call it that, revival literature. And uh, then, of, of course, this emphasis books that emphasize prayer, uh, several tremendous biographies of people that serve the Lord. I don't know about you, but when I read about what people in days gone by have seen God do and enjoyed of God, it puts a hunger in me to see the same thing. And so that's what revival literature is all about. I've got our introductory prayer letter and uh, also our quarter two prayer letter. We've had two of those go out now. And uh, so that's available up here. Avail yourself of anything. You'll also find in the middle of the table there on the left side, um, there is uh, a little chart uh, that gives kind of an explanation of uh, what we call the two lines of texts. 
And uh, basically, here's what it boils down to. Your King James Bible comes from Hebrew Masoretic and Received Text Manuscripts. Hebrew Masoretic being the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures and the Received Text being the Greek New Testament. And your modern versions all come from a different line. And uh, that line, we believe, is corrupt. And so that describes and explains that a little bit better. There's a lot of misinformation going around from the so-called King James Only movement. Uh, and they've got it wrong on some things, and they're, they're kind of making it hard on the rest of us that do understand what we believe and why we believe it. And so take, your, take one of those charts if you want to and study that. It'll help you understand kind of that issue a little bit and uh, uh, hopefully be a blessing to you. I think that's about all I've, uh, I've, I've, I've got time to say anyway. Has anybody got any questions about the ministries? If you think of one... Feel free to call me, text me. I've got a little stack of business cards there. I didn't take the rubber band off those, did I? Don't break it when you take it off, but take that off if you want one. It's got my, that's my cell phone number. The office number's on there. If something comes up in your mind, you've got a question, feel free to reach out and let us know and uh, do anything we can. It's not huge. I don't, I don't know the square footage. I would guess about 3,500 maybe. It's in the same parking lot, and uh, we're in the process of making sure all of that is officially under the authority of that local church. There's still some things that need to be done, but Brother Bob just never got around to. Um, but that was one of the things that myself and the director, Brother Ben, uh, discussed early on, and that's, that's going to be the authority for that ministry is Grace Fellowship Baptist Church. He's our pastor now, and he's also the director of the ministries, and so we'll be answering to them and they're trying to get all that worked out. But uh, that's, yeah, it's in the same parking lot. So it was a no-brainer what would have to happen there. Amen. It's there on, it's in Long, it's Long Shoals Road there in Asheville, just right off the interstate where easy to find. If you're coming down 26 sometime, call me and I'll tell you which exit to take. Come see us. Amen. Pray for us. We've got, uh, we've got about 20 pallets worth of material uh, sitting in a warehouse um, of a uh, machine shop, a dear brother that lives in the area there had uh, for years owned Smoky Mountain Machine, and uh, he had a warehouse. He let us store stuff in. About 20 pallets were sitting over there. We've got room for maybe 10 of those in our warehouse right now, uh, but he just sold the business, and so another company's taken over, and uh, we've got until October to figure out what to do with those. We've been buying some shelving. We're going to try to start going up. We can't go out, so we're going to go up and see if we can't get some more stacked in there. And uh, so the next few weeks are going to be critical in that. Just pray. Uh, pray the Lord even will open opportunities to, to get some of those in the hands of people. I, uh, we don't like just having it laying around. We want to put it in the hands of people, not just the Bibles, but the books and stuff as well. So pray for us in that. We need wisdom, direction in it, and uh, pray the Lord will uh, give, us, give us what we need in that regard. Remember Brother Ura and his family. They are in Germany now. Pray that God would just keep them safe. And here's where we are. Uh, really, this will be my life, just going around trying to make people aware of the different ministries and projects that we've got and trying to raise money for those. But for now, we're trying to just uh, get our own support up. Uh, the secretary position is a paid position, and so I'm just trying to raise support to kind of make up what I was getting as a pastor and as a carpenter. I'm shooting for $3,600 a month. When I get to that, I'm going to walk away from carpentry altogether. I may need some more than that later on, especially traveling like we have been doing, but if I can get to that mark, I can walk away completely from carpentry. If, if I last that long, it's been real tempting just to walk away. The Lord's, the Lord's helped us and met every need. Uh, but right now, uh, we're sitting, if my estimations are right, and it's fluctuated some, but right now we're sitting between sixteen and $1,700 a month. And uh, I think that's pretty good. I've never been on deputation before, but from February to now, that seems like that's pretty good. That's about six months, and we're a little over, uh, we're almost at 50%. So, uh, And I always tell people the dollar figure, because when we had missionaries come to the church, and I know how it is, you can have a missionary every week if you want to, many phone calls as you get. But they'd come and they'd start throwing out percentages. And I, when it was time for question and answer, I'd say, look, I understand that's how they train you to do, but we don't give percents. We give dollars. How many dollars do you need and how many dollars do you have? And, uh, and I, so I just like to be up front about that. Here's what we need. Here's where we are. And uh, so people kind of know how to pray for us especially. And that's what we need above all else. I'm telling you, I just, and this isn't me. I'm not being super spiritual when I say this. But I have not even been able to worry about the financial side of this. God has blessed and helped us. 
and he's taking care of us, and he's opening doors, and I'm excited. I miss the pastor. I was talking to Brother Evan earlier. I mean, I miss that aspect of the of the preaching ministry and the ministering to the people ministry, you know, just so much of that. But God's put us in a whole other arena of things, and I'm enjoying it just as much and enjoying what the Lord's doing. And uh, I appreciate his goodness to us. And just pray that God will help us to be faithful. Amen. That's the main thing, just be faithful. And uh, we're, we're, we're blessed. Anything else? Is this water for me? Amen. Spill it, so I'll be careful. Are you right on?